welcome everyone to the 18th annual MIT Sloan CIO Symposium and the first digital edition. I'm Alan Tate, the executive chair and your host today. Today is episode 10, Reimagining Re Leadership in the Next Normal, Are CIOs Prepared? For questions, please use Q&A at the bottom of your screen and feel free to chat with each other, but we won't be monitoring chat for questions. For social media, use hashtag MITCIO. And also join the community discussion. Post your uh, thoughts and questions in the 2021 symposium program under the topic enterprise leadership. And now let me introduce George Westerman. He is a senior lecturer at the MIT Sloan uh, School of Management. He is also co-chair of our CIO Leadership Award team, and he's also one of our most seasoned moderators. It is my pleasure to welcome George Westerman. Thanks, Alan, uh, and thank you for uh, our two panelists for being here. I can't think of two better people to talk about this topic of how, le how to reimagine leadership in the next normal than these two. Uh, Anupam Kara, Vipin Gupta, Gupta, sorry about that, are uh, two of our five finalists in the MIT CIO Leadership Awards. Uh, there were so many good applications, we actually had to go to five finalists, which has not happened in a very, very long time. So I'm delighted you can both be here. And uh, I'm just gonna get off the stage and just ask you questions so you can share your insights on things. So why don't we start, uh, if you can just, you know, I'll ask you the question, if you can introduce yourself and then tell us a little bit about What's your pandemic story? How did your, you and your company adjust to COVID over the last 14 months? If we could start with Vipin, please. Good morning, George, and good morning, Anupam. Uh, it's great to be on this uh, panel with you. Uh, 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 for a quick introduction, I am the Chief Information Officer for Toyota Financial Services. Uh, we provide financial services products, uh, lending, protection products, insurance, uh, and banking for our dealers and customers. Uh, to answer your question, uh, George, um, about pandemic story, we have many stories. I think pandemic crisis gave us many stories of heroism uh, across the organization. And, I'll, I'll, and as you know, COVID-19 crisis impacted everyone at national and global scale. So when the COVID uh, situation escalated, our attention immediately went to our people, and which means our customers, our dealers, our partners, our workforce. So our customers and dealers needed relief in those tough times, and those were unpredictable times. And uh, we provided them some payment relief options, additional lending support. We processed hundreds of payroll protection program applications for our dealers, protecting thousands of jobs at their business. And this was all happening within a few weeks of that time, while we were also moving our workforce to work remotely. For example, we moved our customer and dealer service centers to work remotely on a new call routing system so that within a couple of weeks, they can operate from home without uh, missing the beat on serving the customers and our dealers, uh, which absolutely was priceless. And while all this was happening, we also launched a new uh, uh, business called Mazda Financial Services on our new private label um, business platform. And this was launched on 1st of April of 2020. And we, we did this while the lockdowns and shelter in place orders were put in place. And it, this was, what, what makes it really special is that we launched this from the ground up on a completely new architecture, the completely new company. We, and, and we kept the promise that we made to Mazda that we will launch this company in seven months. And that's exactly what we did. So there are many such stories that uh, emerged out of crisis. And I think these are the stories that we'll be telling to the next generation of IT leaders in years to come. Let me follow up on a question about that, you know, because certainly cutting over a brand new system uh, and a new service for a whole new company can be tough. You know, you were six months into your seven month process when we all had to go home for COVID. Did you think about delaying that? And, and what was that decision process like to say, you know, as hard as things are right now, we're gonna keep going forward with this launch? Yeah, I think uh, part of that was uh, we had this immense confidence in uh, what we had uh, kind of built uh, for, uh, for our Mazda, for our partners to build this Mazda financial services. And second, the stakes were very high. 
The key here was that we wanted to launch this business at the beginning of the fiscal year, which is 1st of April of 2020. Delaying that would actually impact the business plans and the business uh, performance. <clears throat> so one of the, this was one of the decisions that we had to make was taking this calculated risk, if you will, is our readiness enough to launch the business? And which we call in our uh, internal vocabulary, we call it a most essential product. Do we have the most essential set of capabilities that will help us launch the business? And we took an entrepreneurial approach. We said, we're going to launch this business, but we were ready. If there are any issues, we will be able to address it immediately. And we built this, what we call as a virtual command center. Their entire focus was on serving our dealers and customers for Mazda business at the time in case there was an issue. We were very fortunate. It was absolutely seamless. We didn't really have any critical issues. And to some extent, pandemic actually helped because the business ramped up slower than uh, what was initially planned. So overall, the stars were aligned in, during these tough times, and we were able to launch uh, Mazda Financial Services with great success. And the business has been performing really well. We have exceeded all performance expectations. Wonderful, not thank only you. that, by launching it one year early, we realized <clears throat> a significant value uh, early uh, for the business. Wonderful, thank, thanks for sharing that. It uh, must have been a really uh, challenging time in <laughs> going through those decisions and, and going up. So let's switch over to uh, a, a very different kind of business. Uh, Anupam, if you can say a little bit about yourself and how you, and, and Oshkosh, and how you made this transition happen. Thank you, George, and thank you, Vipin, for sharing the panel here. Uh, let me give a story from the heartland of America, right? Uh, and uh, so my name is Anupam Kare. I'm the CIO. I've been uh, here for three years. Uh, but let me give the context uh, uh, of my story here and this by describing who we are. Uh, we, we are an $8 billion market cap Fortune 500 company with 15,000 team members. Uh, across 22 countries, headquartered in Wisconsin here. What we do as a business is we inject technology in design, development, and manufacturing of specialty vehicles and everything, uh, a specialty vehicle for everyday hero. When we talk about everyday heroes, we're talking about firefighters. We make trucks for them. We're talking about environmental service work, which do the recycling work. And we're talking about the people who do work at hires. So very purposeful work uh, this organization does. What, why it is important is because this work never stopped in pandemic. And if the work that never stopped, we did not stop in producing anything. If you look at our most of the facilities were non-stop uh, producing because in many, many areas we were termed as essential worker. And that particular thing has gone into our psyche. How do we manage pandemic? So I, I put uh, my story into four categories. The first is the people. The second is the facilities. And third is uh, uh, supply chain. And fourth is the customer. So let me go one by one quickly here. On the people first, uh, in the people side, our focus was basically uh, ensuring technology and emotional well-being of all 15,000 team, team members. And when we talk about technology well-being, we're talking about transi transitioning them and making them productive. And I think most of the IT community entire world has done phenomenal job in that. But I think uh, being focusing on the emotional side was very, very needed from our perspective. The second element is we had uh, things like uh, testing facility in our key sites. So just taking care of the people. So that was on the people side. When we talk about facility side, since we were producing, we, we had a strict uh, CDC uh, followed guideline in uh, cleaning protocol because we wanted to give a trust to team members that this is the safest place uh, in the world to work. So that was the one thing, but more importantly, like our, uh, we worked with the, our operations teams to redesign work cells in manufacturing so that we can maintain social distancing. But we also did a cool thing in terms of, we had a wearable technology and wearable technology was meant for ergonomic safety and uh, to basically monitor the wrong postures 
and an alert individual employers. What we did is with the help of the vendor, we repositioned that to be a social distancing uh, kind of application. So if you are, if you are an operator in a manufacturing plant, uh, if you come in close six, six feet, it vibrates. So that was the, the thing on, um, on facility side. But when we go to supply chain, this is the area manufacturing sector has seen the most disruption. But this was a most exciting opportunity from IT standpoint to partner with the, with the businesses and what we did and, and the speed with which we did was phenomenal in how we came together. We lighten up the entire supply chain by implementing a software to give the visibility of entire global supply chain. But we also build a predict, predictive model in record times to basically predict the shortages by manufacturing line by component, but also at the same time using analytics to route our shipping trucks so that we can maximize the load and reduce the cost. So that was on the supply chain side. And finally, on the customer side, uh, we, the customer side, at least one of our segment, the industry norm was, because we produce big trucks, a sizable chunk of cost, our customers used to come and physically inspect the trucks. And, uh, and they give feedback and we repair. And while during that period, they stay here and then go back. We provided a virtual inspection uh, a mechanism for them so that remotely they can get the similar level of details. And it was twofold. It was a technology implementation, but also helping people to change the habit. And it become very, very easy in the COVID time. So I think our, our COVID story, I just wanted to summarize in four parts here. Well, thank you. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's funny. Every time I talk to you, I remember sitting in my uncle's fire truck when I was a little kid and what a delight that was. And you get to sit in those trucks all the time. And that's kind all of the stuff. <laughs> uh, so, you know, this, one of the things we talked about was this idea of getting that global view of your supply chain to know what's happening, to know where your risks are, to put the predictive analytics in to understand what it might happen and how you need to adjust. And you did that really quickly. Is that something you already had planned? Or is that something that you just decided to do? And to relate to that also, how do you get it done so quickly? I think if the, the first of all, I think old adage, necessity is the mother of invention, mm -hmm. right? And when revenues were impacted and we were very much see, seeing that we may not be able to produce, this became, this became an organizational rally cry. So me and my counterpart, uh, who's a senior VP of supply chain, we came together and and we have, it was a kind of a natural, this is where we see when there is a crisis, right? Human beings come together in a very extraordinary manner. And that's what we saw at the team level. They came together, the partnering with suppliers. Suppliers were becoming part of our ecosystem, the analytics modeler. So it, it is just kind of, uh, you know, it became a, uh, what do you call, one fight, one team. So one mm -hmm. goal, one team. And, and that became a more of an emotional thing that I have to, we together have to help this business not to stop production because our production workers are really working <clears throat> very hard amid this coach. So that was the reason. Uh, uh, to, your, uh, to your question, whether we were planning, we were definitely thinking about many initiatives in supply chain, but uh, this brought into a priority uh, to focus on. Great. Thank you. Uh, and you know, just, just, just to add on to what you both said, you know, the idea that, that the crisis created a sense of urgency and a sense of teamwork that you're going to get this done and you're going to find a way to fight through the problems and get the challenges done. What did you learn from this experience that would apply to a non-crisis situation later so you can have that same kind of teamwork, that same kind of agility and innovativeness the next time you do this? Yeah, and, and I, this is an excellent question because we were doing a, a self-assessment as a leadership and, and individually, and we were uh, sharing. And I, I learned personally uh, three lessons there. And, um, and, uh, and I'll summarize one by one. One is the connected leadership. The second uh, is uh, purpose versus location. And the third I'll say digital savviness. I think I found new meaning of digital savviness. So I'll, I'll go one by one. So when I'm talking about connected leadership, if you remember when the pandemic was going on, 
the cyber incidents were also happening. That was another area business were impacting. You also re remember the social unrest were happening, right? So what happened is when we're talking about connected leadership, the leadership was connected to employees, to connected to customers and society, and has a, an ability to focus on issues beyond balance sheets. We focused on issues which were beyond balance sheet. These are not normal questions. So I think that's the, that's the learning is that we need to be, we talk about connected products, connected manufacturing, but I think the, the same concept applies in connected leadership. The second dimension is the whole notion that collaboration happens around conference room. And, and I think this, this was my assumption as well, but collaboration happens around a purpose. And that's what we have seen is if, if a, as a leader, we provide a clarity, more clarity and empowerment, the output is produced. So, uh, so that's the industry norm and our way of thinking has been challenged. And I, the, well, I will give credit to a circumstances, but also our team. I think we knew our team better than before during this crisis. And the third element uh, as a leadership lesson is, I think I got a new interpretation of uh, digital savviness. Uh, the original assumption was, is about understanding new technology and applying to business situation, right? You understand technology. And I think from my perspective, what I realize is digital savviness is a mindset and mindset which craves for data and facts, right? Which tries to create predictiveness in an unpredictable world and has an agility to pivot from problem to problem, right? And I think that's the, that's the new definition in my mind, digital savviness. If we have that mindset, because the circumstances will be different, a world is not going to be normal. We may talk about this is the next normal, but it will be different situations. And, and we will be confronted with many things coming to us and how we process them and result. I think that's the requires the digital savviness. So I, I say in summary, there are three things. Uh, the first is connected leadership, purpose, as well as the digital savviness. Wonderful, great, thank you. Uh, and Vipin, what are you? What, what are some big leadership you've lesson, lessons you're going to take away from here that are going to carry forward for you? Yeah, and similarly, first of all, Anupam, thank you for sharing your insights and everything that Anupam said uh, resonates with me because it was a similar kind of lessons that. Uh, I was learning or we were learning. Um, so instead of just repeating some of those, uh, let me give you a little bit uh, another context here. As we know, as uh, Anupam also said, the crisis brings out the true character in humans. And I would say in organization as well, right? And so in Toyota, one of our core values is respect for people. And I think that kind of became a guiding light for us uh, during this crisis. And, uh, uh, and the people are the soul of, our, of any business, definitely of our business. Uh, if you really think about this, every business is a human business. We are a human business. Our customers, our dealers, our partners, our employees, our extended workforce, our communities. So my leadership lesson and aha from last year was that we need to stay focused on people. It's always people first. We always talk about digital first, mobile first, agile first, all that won't matter. People first, it is, uh, and if we do it right by the people, all will be right uh, for the business. So, uh, and, and in last uh, a year or so, it, uh, we had faced one crisis after another, health crisis, political crisis, social crisis, and so we have been, as the leaders of the organization, we have been pulled into being culture leaders of the organization, right? And the way we say things, how we listen to each other, how we show up as an ally has become an important part of our day-to-day -day leadership. And we are used to making these hard decisions on strategy and prioritization and resources. Now the hard decision is on which issues should we speak out on? not because of politics or political alignment, but because of what it means to our teams, what it means to the culture of our team. And so being a, being a CIO, I used to always think about driving revenue. It's about controlling cost. Now I feel like it's about how do we 
kind of how, how these social issues have become business issues. And we had to take our leadership to this kind of a human level, where we have to listen to our teams, make sure we are giving our employees a voice to be heard. And I think the only way that one can do, or at least I can do, is to be who I am. Be authentic, model this courage, and then show this empathy for everyone across the organization. So bottom line, my lesson is be human and prioritize people first and rest will follow. Well, well thank you. I, you know, it, I, it's I, interesting. I, I, oh, so, sorry, Anupam, go ahead. I just wanted to add to what Vipin said, I'm, and, and I like everything he said. I think the cultural leader, which he's talked about, I, I think from a CIO standpoint for long, uh, we have taken role that we are technology leaders, right? And we bridge the gap with business, right? Uh, and we try to uh, basically integrate or combine our strategy with business strategy. But this was an opportunity and, and it came naturally that we all became a business leaders. And we all became business leaders because we had to focus uh, as a part of the CEO leadership team to a much bigger agenda of the organization, whether it is a whether it is a supply chain, whether it is the health of employees, whether it is the facilities, whether it is a customer, uh, we became larger than ourselves leader. And, and now it feels like uh, finance delivers value through their knowledge of finance. We deliver value through technology, but we all are a, a bigger business leaders. You know, it's such an important point for every IT leader in anywhere around the world is if you're just focusing on IT, you're not focusing big enough. Because in the end, the IT doesn't provide value. It's how the business changes that provides value. And you have a lot of advice you can offer on there. So you, you guys have done it big, but anyone, anywhere in the IT organization, that idea of understanding the business well enough to have those conversations is just essential. So that's great. So as we think about understanding the business well enough then, um, <clears throat> you must be thinking about what life is going to be like as we start to go back. And Anupam, I know you're, a lot of your people are back already because you have to be hands-on to make these things work, but I imagine your company is going to be different. Uh, Vipin, I met, you've got a lot of people remote and some will stay remote, some will go. Uh, but Vipin, why don't you just start us off if you could, you know, how's your business going to look different, say a year or two years from now than it did before? Yeah, we we know one thing. It is it is definitely going to look different than what it was a year back. So, uh, <laughs> and I would say uh, we are kind of almost like these engagement and interaction models that we had are shifting on all fronts. I think that's the more profound change that's going to happen. We can talk about digital. We can talk about capabilities, but it's the underlying way we interact with each other, way we interact with our customers, way we interact with our partners is changing. And I think the big shift that I'm seeing is finally the promise of dig digital is getting fulfilled, which is always about empowerment to humans, right? Giving this empowerment, giving this choice and giving this convenience, that seems to be the shared theme of this kind of a future uh, interaction model or the business model. And in last year or in last couple of years, the uh, new technology advancements largely driven by automation, artificial intelligence, and I would say this access to unprecedented computing capacity. I think that's going to help us do way more than what we have done in some recent years for our team members and for our customers. So one is for workers itself, the new way of working will allow working from home or office, will create a higher flexibility and higher productivity for our workforce. So while it seems a hybrid model, to me, more importantly, it will be a flexible model. It really empowers our employees to choose where they want to work. And this new way of working is going to already, it's already accelerating our redesign of our processes, our policies, our performance management methods, et cetera. And in some cases, organizational structures, so all that is going to start to look different uh, once we kind of, as this COVID crisis uh, gets behind us. On customer front, uh, for them, just like uh, Anupam said, there's a different uh, one, there's a better understanding of what digital savvy means, but we also know now, and this is another myth that has been busted, that some customers are not going to adopt to digital. Digital is now normal. It is expected, it is new way of life. 
uh, for at least for most of our customers. So we are now building capabilities and experiences that is going to further empower our customers. And empowerment is key here. Empower our customers and dealers to do business with us digitally where they want and how they want. So we are moving from this idea of omni-channel to what I call as on my channel. And that is really important, a customer chosen experience, right? Customer will decide where to do business, business with us and how, and to buy a car, for example, they may come to dealership, but they may choose not to. They may choose to own a car or they may choose to just take a ride share. Either way, we will have an option for them. And that's our new business model. That's our new operating model. Hmm. So in this post COVID kind of business model, customer is empowered to choose the channel. Worker is empowered to choose the workplace. So this finally, this promise of digital to empower humans is becoming real. And I think that's going to shape our new business model. Okay, great, thank you. And, and Akram, you said, you know, uh, you, you, were fo you were categorized as, you know, essential. So you kept working through this and you had to make all these changes happen. But I imagine more changes are going to come. So how are you gonna look different? How's, how's Oshkosh gonna look different a year or two from now? Yeah, I, I think the, the first overarching theme which we have been discussing and uh, uh, is as a society, I think what we have experienced is the convenience and the speed. It's the table is take, it is not an option, right? So from our personal life to business life, that is the underlying theme. If you are a production worker or if you're a non-production worker, right? Convenience and speed will uh, will be a underlying thing. They are all expecting. We expect in our personal life. When it comes to ourselves, how things are going to change? I think we we in our case we are going to see two changes, and 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 we are still uh, discussing, debating, and we haven't finalized. One is on the production front, right? On the production front, I think we will see, uh, and we have seen, but we are seeing more acceleration in bringing technologies, right? Which can make the manufacturing low touch. So I give an example, uh, two, two technologies we just now uh, implemented last couple of months is computer vision for defect, right? Computer vision can do better job than any human being and it is not replacing, it is helping people. We're doing uh, digital twin and optical scanning of most complex parts where it was just not humanly possible. So on the, on the manufacturing side, we will see insertion of more technologies uh, to make environment more sustainable for our workforce. When it comes to non-production stuff, I think the, 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 the point which we are seeing is employees are thinking, why do I need to come? If I can be productive for 14 months without coming, right? And we as a leadership um, are still figuring out what is the long-term implication on, on uh, creativity, uh, productivity. We don't know the answer to this question, but, but we are confident that if it is a, a, a situation like what we experienced 14 months, I think we are pretty good in doing, but can we sustain innovation, right? Uh, which requires a bouncing back of ideas and, and whiteboard present discussion and all that. So I, I think we are uh, kind of uh, moving towards, we are a flexible workplace, but we'll be moving towards a hybrid workplace in environment where uh, we have a dedicated collaboration days and, and, there, and then dedicated the WebEx or team or Zoom days. So I think that's the current uh, thinking. But overarching theme here is, Convenience and speed is an expectation. Anything and everything we do from a customer employee, we, we have to keep that theme in mind. Great, we have a question from the, the, uh, the, the audience here. Uh, if you had to guess, what percentage of your workforce is gonna be back at the office once everything settles down? Either I'd say your... from, a, from a, a financial services perspective, uh, we expect about 50% based on uh, this is based on a lot of surveys we have been doing consistently and con continuously uh, kind of voice of employee uh, surveys and a pulse check over uh, last year. And uh, well, well, the data has been evolving, but uh, I think where it has landed is about 50% of the workforce uh, will 
uh, be back, but it may not be the same 50% showing up every day, but 50% is more of a capacity. Okay, in, great, great. In our case, again, the answer is split into two parts, right? Manufacturing, production, 100%. They have been and they will be, right? Non-production, non the way we are uh, and anticipating is uh, uh, what will happen is not a percentage of population, percentage of days they will be on office. I think I will see that way. I think we'll see hybrid number of days people coming here and, and number of days uh, people working from home. You know, it's interesting uh, that you talked about, you know, this, these people being back and forth, but in a, in a somewhat unpredictable and emergent way, uh, you know, when I hear what that means to me is, for example, you know, you think we think about, well, what would that do to our real estate? Do we need as much office space? Uh, those kinds of things. And, and if people are working from home, then maybe we don't. On the other hand, if you're expecting everybody to be in for collaboration days and they're staying home other time, then you need 100 percent because 100 percent of people are there from time to time. Are you thinking about what this means for your office space? Are you going to be able to save some office space with these new moves? If uh, from our perspective, I think the considering the real estate for, uh, footprint we have, because our real estate is centered around our manufacturing mm. uh, facilities, right? So uh, our dynamics around real estate is very different. So we are not thinking in terms of uh, do we have a goal to reduce real estate cost? I think what we are looking at is uh, can we sustain the same level of uh, productivity and creativity and what is the best way to do it? So our, our, our questions are different. Okay, great. Yeah, and the same, same here, just like Anupam, and I think Anupam mentioned this earlier that uh, the collaboration happens around the idea of purpose, not around the conference rooms, right? So, but that also also is the same idea here. The purpose here is to provide this kind of a hybrid model, but more importantly, this flexibility. So it is definitely leading to what I'll call as a redesign of our physical space. So that's where the focus is for this kind of a hybrid flex model. Will it help us from a real estate efficiencies? Absolutely, yes. We are also looking at those, but that's not the primary purpose. That's kind of a secondary benefit out of this. If there is one, primary purpose is how do we make sure that we leverage this kind of a new operating model, new behavioral model, and provide the tools and the space for creating more in continued innovation, continued collaboration when needed. So you are absolutely right. There are times when we will need full capacity spaces. And that's where I believe the new design of the workplace is going to be really important. And that's where we are focused on. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, related to that then, uh, when I first started working, we were all really happy to have our cubes. Actually, when I first started working, we were engineers at a long set of tables, no walls, shared phones, these kinds of things. We didn't have computers at the time. And then we were really happy to get our little <clears throat> cubicles with the high walls so we could focus. And then the, the trend became open you know, pits where we work together, but then people put their headphones on so they don't need to be disturbed. And so, you know, so as you think about these new collaborative spaces, what are they gonna look like? Because you know, certainly closed was less collaborative. Open had its own issues. Now we're you got an opportunity to rethink. Have you had a chance to rethink what those rooms look like yet? Not, uh, I would say not uh, specifically. That again, this is all we are we are um, in <clears throat> uncharted territory. I think we have to be super nimble around this and see what happens and be responsive to uh, how our behaviors evolve. But broadly speaking, I think there is a, one thing is very clear that we need what I'll call as more open spaces. And it's less about the closed spaces, less about the rooms, more about the open spaces, more collaboration, more conversations. Because one of the things, as, as we all know, one of the things that has happened and that's going to be a challenge for the future is a lot of conversations used to happen in between the meetings when we are walking from one meeting to another, um, walking from, a garage to the office, right? So all those conversations like uh, that in, in, uh, in uh, this remote work environment or hybrid environment, less and less of that is happening. So I think one of the things we know is that more open spaces, more collaborative spaces uh, would be uh, something which would be beneficial. And then there is a whole other element, which is 
there is an we we talk about collaboration, but I think there's a bigger element here that we had to worry about. That's the learning environment. Uh, we are also uh, creating learning environments and learning spaces in our organization. So a lot to think about, George, and that's the kind of active conversation that's going on. Uh, and so we are taking one step at a time, uh, listening to what our uh, employees and workforce are saying. And then we know that for next year or maybe two years, that's what we will be doing. There'll be a lot of what we will call in our Toyota terminology is uh, Kaizen, the continuous improvement around this. Okay, great. Anup, is there something you wanted to add there? Yeah, I just wanted to add, I, I, I agree with the, what we've been said. In our, in our case, what happened, we built a headquarter in 29, Octo, uh, 29 of October where we moved. And when this building was designed, it was designed from a perspective of uh, uh, future of the workforce, right? And, and the, some of the concepts which uh, uh, Vipin was talking about, we have lots of open spaces. We have more conference rooms than than, um, than uh, uh, I would say offices. We have very few number of offices. So I think we have created a template pre-pandemic, which we will help it, help us. But I, I think we, as we dis go through the hybrid workforce debate uh, and come to some alignment there, I think there is a concept uh, of uh, hoteling we talk about that there are certain places where people will come and go. And, and maybe for certain roles. I think that concepts, we may have to reconfigure some of our workforce to adjust to that requirement. Thanks. Uh, th that leads to another really good question. Now, you know, we've been talking now from your position from trying to lead these changes and re-envision these changes for your organization. Let's jump down to the employee side. As they see it, the changes that are happening and the changes that come, um, you know, what do you think the biggest challenge that your people are going to face, both in IT and in the rest of the business? What challenges are they going to face as you move to this new world? Anup, you want to get us started? Yeah, so the, if I talk about um, IT specifically, I think there will be, uh, I see two major things, right? Number one, <clears throat> employees will be self-debating, right? Uh, self-debating uh, about the need for going to workplace. We may be talking about hybrid, but they will be debating that I have been very productive, why I need to do something different and let that's come. So that's the internal debate uh, in their head um, because that comes from uh, other areas like economics, commute time and all those things coming into picture, why they think that way. But the second element I see uh, is uh, uh, digitization is going to increase. And that means there's lots of, uh, you can see both ways, lots of opportunities for us, but lots of workload from employees, right? So workload keeps on increasing and not necessarily the employees. So I think those are the things from IT standpoint. From a business standpoint, I think there will be a, a kind of a, shift in terms of low touch versus high touch. I think what I'm already seeing is low touch in transaction and high touch in relationships. So we used to use transaction as a mechanism to build a relationship. And I think in back of our mind, we have to separate. Transaction has to be ease of use, convenience, it has to be low touch. And when you are trying to build a deeper relationship, the frequency may not be that much, but it has to be high touch. That's what uh, I think I'm seeing the shift. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think just to add to uh, what Anubam said, um, I would say if I had to pick up the biggest challenge or the worry that I have, I think we will be able to, I believe more confident around technology, technology solutions and all kinds of business models and how to execute on that. One, one challenge that I feel uh, we're going to face is to continue to maintain this momentum around performance and talent development, workforce performance, talent development. And in this kind of, as I mentioned, like in this, uh, this new remote flex world, this informal, these unplanned, incidental, these organic conversations in between the meetings is becoming less and less. A lot of these people development type of conversations, the mentoring kind of conversations were happening in between the meetings. Uh, and I worry that uh, we may 
uh, our crisis has given a high levels of productivity. And we, uh, I worry that we may see a dip in employee engagement and productivity, and which will further add to the challenge of sustaining the digital talent. So, uh, and it will be very difficult to sustain these high levels of productivity if we don't continue to engage our team members to kind of fill this social gap and this new normal. So, uh, I, and I also believe, I think we are seeing the hottest market for talent right now. It's almost like a war for talent is going on. And to sustain this talent development and to attract new talent, we are already investing in reskilling and upskilling our workforce to achieve this high engagement and attention. I believe companies like ours are the universities of the future. Uh, we, had, uh, we have launched, for example, a TFS Digital Academy with the sole purpose of elevating digital proficiency of our teams across the organization, not just IT. The idea is the harnessing the power of software in this digital world is not just IT's job. It's everyone's job. Everyone, whether you are business, IT doesn't matter. If you don't know how to harness the power of software, you're going to be left behind. So we are, in, we are introducing new ways of educating and new ways of engaging our workforce and we're developing this to sustain this intensity and the focus and the collaboration digitally that was fueled by a COVID crisis. So we had to take that kind of learning and move that forward, manage performance of our team members better and sustain our talent and to a large extent, win this talent war, if you will, uh, to win the business in the future. Yeah, you picked up on two really important points I'm paying a lot of attention to right now. I'm focusing a lot of my work on, on workforce learning and how can organizations, uh, how can companies help their people and how can other people help people, help workers get the right skills to work. Uh, but you said something really important that has been coming up in a lot of conversations, which is managed performance. And when you're in a, this virtual world now where you don't see your people as much, or you see, see them only in meetings, does that change the way you manage performance? Do you need to think about it differently? I believe yes. Uh, and uh, I, I, on the other hand, I also don't know exactly how. And I think that's, that's where I think we are struggling in a way to kind of take one step at a time. Uh, one of the things I would say personally that I've started to do is, and I want to do more, is we have to find alternative and creative ways to compensate for the social gap that is created by not being together in the same location and being digital. And it's not about being digital or, uh, or physically together, but it is more about uh, when we are in a digital context, we're just moving from one meeting to another, from one camera meeting to another meeting. Uh, and I think we need to fill that social gap. And that is where more and more participation in mentorship programs, more and more making oneself available for mentoring, and so it's just create, use these other tools and other methods to drive that conversation in an informal way and use that to kind of do more coaching and also do more coaching in the moment. So a lot of this performance management, this idea, and we have been talking about it for years, this idea that performance management happens once a quarter or once a year, I think that has to evolve into almost like, it has to be more frequent, more informal, more in the moment, uh, but how is that going to translate into a, a formal method or methodology for the larger corporation is still to be seen. You know, it's interesting you talk about the coaching in the moment. I, it, you just made me think about some things I'm doing with my students and my people when they're in meetings. Uh, it's just those private Zoom chats that only they can see. That is a way of coaching in the moment. Uh, I imagine it also drives them just slightly nuts, you know, having the boss send these private chats in. But uh, that's just not possible if you're in a conference room. That's right. And so uh, th there's a little bit that that's an easy thought, but I think you're thinking even beyond that, which is good. Yeah, that's a great point. I think there are a lot of things that we could not actually, and we don't think about it always. We always think about as if this video call, the Zoom calls are limiting us. Uh, in, in a way, they have provided some alternative ways that were not available before. Right? This is a great example where we can interact with each other, one-on-one -on -one interactions in the middle of the meeting that we can have, now have privately on a chat in the moment, which was not possible. If you think about it, if eight people are sitting in a room in a conference room, you couldn't have that one-on-one -on -one, uh, sidebar conversations uh, without looking like you are uh, not paying attention to the meeting. <laughs> so I think we have to really think about what are the new uh, capabilities and tools that this new model provides us and try to maximize uh, the leverage from them.
So, so more to come. Uh, I'm sure I think this will be a topic, uh, not within our organization, but uh, broadly uh, across many organizations. Thanks. Yeah, and just to add to that, I think we all will be learning as time evolves in this space, but I think I observed two things, right? Um, the engagement that, that was happening naturally has to be converted into an intentional engagement. I think we, like what George mentioned, he, he sets up a private chat, right? In the past, uh, we, we just pass by and meet people somewhere near the coffee machine and, and have a conversation. So I think that's a transition for manager and leadership. How do we become more intentional and engaging? So that's the one shift uh, I see. The second piece which you were talking about, I, I think we have to delineate managing people versus managing performance. I think in the past, they were all mixed together. We thought we are managing performance, but we were managing people. We thought we are managing people, we were managing performance. Now it has to be more clear because you don't have those opportunities to manage people or their activities. You have to manage towards outcome. And, and that requires, uh, we haven't figured it out, but that's what we're thinking about is what are the, the key uh, overarching metrics in each subgroups we need to have and, and redefine what a good looks like and let people exceed. So I think the leadership responsibility in post COVID is different and, uh, and have, we have a more responsibility than before. We, we, we had a little bit pass on these kind of things, but now we have to be more intentional. By the way, I really appreciate both of you saying, you know, we don't know, if sure, we're, we're not sure yet, but we're gonna figure this out. Both of you said that without any prompting. And that's actually, I think a lesson for a lot of us that that's okay, <laughs> you know, even at the top leadership level, it's okay to not know as long as you're intentional in where you're going, which is nice. Uh, we have a question from the group uh, in supply chains. Uh, do you think supply chains are going to become less global just to be, be more resilient and flexible? Or do you think they're going to stay global and have to be different? Uh, let, let's go to uh, Anupam because, you know, this is a big deal for you. Yeah, I, I think the, the if you look at the forces of the supply chain, uh, what is happening, that will require rethinking. I don't think anybody knows the right answer. The, the couple of things happening means you look at national nationalistic sentiments are increasing. Mm -hmm. The trade wars are increasing, and the pandemic has definitely showed uh, that uh, our supply chain is so vulnerable from logistics, transportation to a source of manufacturing. So definitely there's a thinking going on uh, in the organization. So first of all, I think it will be a factor for all companies. And if you are a technology company, you will be thinking about IT supply chain. Do I need to outsource everything to India or China? If you are a manufacturer, you'll be thinking about component factory. So I think this will be thinking. But uh, uh, my, my point is that we will have a kind of a different strategy. Do we need to be totally dependent to a single supplier in single nation? Do we need to have dual supplier in two locations? I think that discussions are already happening. Supply chain changes will take time, but I don't see a scenario that suddenly a global supply chain become a national supply chain. It's just my personal view. I don't see that that's happening because economics are not there. Thanks. Great. Yeah, and just to pick on uh, one of the points that Anupam mentioned, and I think that's an important point as we are becoming more and more digital and more and more digitally connected. And, uh, one is that obviously we always talk about mostly manufacturing supply chain, but I know you mentioned something about IT supply chain, the digital supply chain. That's the new supply chain that is emerging and forming. All of us are so interdependent. We have shared suppliers. We have shared risk around those suppliers Then suppliers are in all these locations. And with cloud-based technologies, the cloud uh, centers are in different locations in different countries. So. When something happens, uh, our business could be impacted today by something that happens not done in our data centers or even in uh, the, our next, our, uh, let's call it third parties, but it could be fourth party or the fifth party. So we really need to understand these interdependencies of these uh, kind of suppliers and, and, and technologies that really bring the solution together and what risk do they pose 
And a little bit of, I think, when we think about this in context of information supply chain, so same nationalist uh, type sentiments are going to impact that as well, because as each country or each geography starts to protect the data within their nation, that's going to have an impact on how we architect the future business on technologies. So, so this whole discussion of supply chain has expanded from just a manufacturing supply chain traditionally, but also into this digital and technology and IT supply chain. Great, thank you. You know, one of the things I've been playing around with a little bit <clears throat> is some of the assumptions that felt right before COVID and maybe might not be so right anymore. And they really need some rethinking. So, you know, our customers really value the human touch. Certainly in the digital world, people were already figuring out they actually wanted to have, they wanted personal service, but maybe not from a person. And then COVID came along, I don't want a person anywhere near me, right? And so, you know, that certainly is one that changed. Uh, another one was, you know, people won't pay full price for a digital version of our experience. Certainly we're learning in education that maybe that's not true. If they're still getting the same value from it and they may be saving the travel costs. And certainly for movies, I'm paying just as much, if not more for movies to download them as I was to, to go to a theater. Uh, we talked about people, you know, won't be productive unless they're in the office. We know we're going around and, and finding that to not be true. What do you think, the two of you, um, what are some assumptions that you, you or your senior teams that you're working with had going in that might not be so true anymore in this post-COVID world? Yeah, there are, I, I don't know if we list down, there will be many, many assumptions. Which <laughs> but if I take at the highest level, I think, uh, uh, digital is an digital is an option. Right now, I'm busy. Let let me focus on the business. Now, digital is the business. So, digital is no longer an option. That's that's assumption. If you go into the in the tactical level, is uh, we're talking about I, I, uh, is like in the IT world, we have been trained. When you roll out your software, right, you have to have a huge change management, user education, and training, right. Now, now the question here is. Users are very, very smart and it's proven that they train themselves. So we have to create a mechanism like that. So I think our assumption around users about uh, the digital has, has changed, but underlying theme, which I mentioned before, I think convenience and speed will matter, right? And that has the, the that, that is underlying things which everybody is expecting. And uh, so in, uh, anything which is not convenient, you gave example of movie. It is more convenient to consume movie at home on demand than going somewhere else. I think the same thing. On the relationship front, again, it is a, a person and service were bundled together. We thought that person is delivering service and while service was different. And I think we all uh, kind of seeing in many, many transactions where these two things are being separated. Let me focus on service. I may not need the person. Thank you. What do you think, Vipin? Uh, yeah, so just like Anupam said, that there's a list of things that uh, those uh, myths have been busted <laughs> through this crisis around what can be digital and what cannot be. Um, so I think the, the it's uh, absolutely right. It is, uh, it's not an option. Uh, digital is a new way of life. And I would say that the question uh, at the leadership table is not about what should become digital. The question is what should remain physical only? Uh, and I think that's a big question. So for us, uh, there are many examples. One simple example is uh, uh, one of the myths was, or we used to assume that uh, to buy a car, you have to go to the dealership. Now you can buy a car without going to the dealership. And uh, we are working with a lot of our dealers uh, to kind of uh, uh, allow that process to all happen without leaving your uh, your homes. So I think uh, something that fundamental, that uh, that was a very uh, strong assumption that has been proven to uh, be wrong, or at least it has evolved through this crisis. We're still working through it, but uh, those kind. Of, that's another one, for example, is uh, that um, if you want to build uh, large strategic roadmaps, the leadership team has to go to this kind of an offsite uh, some kind of a strategy discussion. Uh, no, we don't need to do that. And I think we have been building, we, have, we made really good decisions, quality decisions 
uh, to drive kind of the speed and being uh, nimble along the way without having to be physically together in some kind of an offsite. So I think a lot of these assumptions have been busted along the way. And, and it is not, it's really not either or or, it's not digital or physical, it is really the and, and the, the de-definition of what the digital and physical means uh, is being redefined. Wonderful, just, thank you. Just add to that, I think one example we have seen is we, we were having a big presence in uh, show, uh, uh, shows, shows like uh, product shows, uh, both in the US and in, uh, in Europe and Asia. And uh, we didn't have that. And, and now businesses are really thinking about is in 2022, do I really need to be there? And what is the marginal value of that? I think they themselves are challenging that uh, assumption that, and, and we may be there, but what will happen most likely is our presence will be uh, more, more, I'm not speculating on behalf of the company, but our presence may be more nimble and it may be more cost effective. It will be more meaningful and in combined with, uh, with virtual. Thanks. So while, you know, this was an experiment having only two people on a panel. And, uh, you know, usually there are more people on a panel and you get a lot of voices. We wanted to do this with just two people because it gave a chance to really get to know you and gave a chance to really have let you show the kinds of thinking you do and the kinds of insights you do. So I wanna thank you for going as deep as you did on these questions and being willing to be on this small panel in this way. We have about two minutes left. And so with two minutes left, can I ask you a question that can't possibly be answered in a minute each, but if you can give it a shot, right? And that is, you know, we have a lot of technology people here, a lot of CIOs here in the audience listening. Uh, what's the most important thing that CIOs can do to help their business counterparts, their CXO counterparts, understand how to think about post-COVID business. Who wants to take it first? I'll I'll take it. See, one of one of the things which we have uh, we, we we have grounded uh, ourselves in the leadership team is unpredictiveness of the of uh, whether it is a society, whether it's a global economy or business and all <clears> that. And, uh, and how do we make sense out of it and make it more predictable? And I think that's the advice is that less, the world is going to comp be complex, let's make it more predictable and have a, a guided leadership. Is a technology guided leadership decision making? And that's where uh, we can help our businesses uh, um, going forward. Okay, thanks. And you get the last word here, Vipin. Yeah, I, I think uh, one of the most important things we can help our uh, CXO counterparts and peers is to ensure that we do not take the we do not take the foot off the pedal of decision making. I think the crisis we changed the way we make decisions and the speed of decision making was amazing. And we part of that was we we learned and uh, the crisis taught us to focus on prioritizing what is truly, truly important for the company. It was a natural waste buster. And I think Wonderful. we need to maintain that uh, decision-making speed. And as CIOs and IT leaders, that's what we can help. We can provide the data and the information and design trade-offs to our CXOs so that they can make these decisions quickly. If you really think about the CIOs and IT leaders are designing the future version of the organization for the company. We are the architects of the future version of the company. And that's where we can help the CXOs to be the chief speed officers and chief nimble officers. Uh, and I think, uh, and this will not only design the right version of the next, uh, next version of the company, but it will also keep us ready uh, for the next crisis. We don't know when it's gonna happen, but if it happens, we'll be ready. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you both for your insights, uh, for being here. Uh, both of you will be with us again for next week's panel, where all five panelists will be with us, to all five for the finalists, and where we'll give the big award uh, for this year's CIO Leadership Award. So thanks again, back to you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you, George. Well, thank you, George, Vipin, and Anupan. Uh, that was a very interesting discussion. And for the audience, let's continue the conversation. Join the all member chat, which is live right now, uh, and post your thoughts in the 2021 uh, symposium program under the topic, 
enterprise leadership. Join us tomorrow at 10.30 a.m. Chitra Dwarka, our chair of the partner team, will join me to co-host an open discussion about enterprise leadership, and we will talk about the two panels that happened this week. Also, join us next Tuesday, May 18th at 10.30, as George mentioned. We will be doing the CIO award presentation and panel. That's going to be a great episode. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Yes, replays will be posted in the 2021 Symposium Program Agenda. That's all for today. Bye for now.